Thank you. So this is the title of my book project. And before I begin my proper talk, I would just like to show you uh, the structure of the work. It's in five chapters, the first of which deals with uh, the exemplar in ancient Greece, particularly surrounding the paradigm of hero. The second chapter turns to uh, the New Testament and considers Jesus Christ as exemplar. Uh, chapter three deals with paradigms of exemplarity in contemporary ethics. Uh, the fourth deals with uh, debates in contemporary moral philosophy, namely supererogation and the unity of the virtues. And then the fifth chapter, the last chapter, is a case study of two Medal of Honor winners, Desmond Doss and Emil Capon, asking are these uh, lives properly narrated as heroic or as saintly. Today I will be dealing almost exclusively with the third chapter because uh, I would rather try to make a case uh, more substantively uh, and this is really, I would say, the conceptual foundation of the whole work. So if this part doesn't work, then I'm not sure uh, much of the rest will. <clears throat> First two chapters, of course, are, are a bit more historical, exegetical. I will be getting a little bit into the application of exemplarity to Christian ethics, though, at the end. All right, so my project inquires into the relationship between our notions of moral goodness and the agents we regarded ex as exemplifying that goodness. Any search for instances of a phenomenon presumes a working conception of the phenomenon for which one is searching. So when studying moral exemplars, one must have some idea of what a moral exemplar is. So first we have to ask what we have in mind when we invoke the category moral. On what grounds do we deem conduct morally good? What makes some good conduct morally exceptional? What then qualifies an agent as a moral exemplar? And here, which deals with my study, are there different paradigms of moral exemplarity? And if so, what is at stake in the prioritization of certain paradigms? For instance, to take the central question of the book, is sanctity a particular mode of heroism? Whoops, sorry. Is sanctity a particular mode of heroism? Or is heroism a particular mode of sanctity? These are the questions that underlie my study which operates at the meta-ethical level prior to empirical testing, where one seeks to clarify what is meant by moral excellence and under what conditions one may encounter it. Constructive scholarship at this level of analysis is very important since it seeks to secure the philosophical foundations upon which empirical studies build. Clarity at this level can forestall many points of dispute that often arise as a result of misunderstanding what the primary object of moral inquiry actually is. You keep using that word, says Inigo Montoya to Vizzini in The Princess Bride. I do not think it means what you think it means. This has been the subject of quite the few internet memes. But I imagine this sort of misunderstanding to be at the heart of many disputes regarding the nature of moral excellence as well. Take, for example, Susan Wolf's seminal article from 1982 entitled Moral Saints, in which she advances an argument against any direct correlation between saints and between uh, traits that would make an agent's actions maximally good and those that would make a life attractive to others. From the beginning, she defines a moral saint as, quote, a person whose every action is as morally worthy as can be. It's far from obvious, as Wolf herself admits, whether anyone answering to this definition has ever in fact existed, but if one did, they would be a colorless, humorless, neurotic killjoy who thinks of nothing else but the maximal fulfillment of moral demands. But what if, however, one were to suggest that the maximal fulfillment of moral demands actually has very little to do with sainthood? If one were to presume an alternative conception of sainthood that even rules out obsessive obedience to any abstract moral theory, then one might also aptly respond to Wolf, you keep using that word, but I do not think you know what it means. To inquire into what makes moral exemplars exemplary is to call forth one's most fundamental assumptions about human excellence, as well as one's deepest methodological assumptions regarding how to determine and evaluate such excellence. For Wolf, what makes one a moral saint is an agent's perfect conformity to a moral theory, such that principles like the maximization of well-being or the adoption of a universalizable maxim take first place in a saint's practical reasoning. Wolf's distaste for this sort of, for this portrait of human excellence is wholly understandable, even commendable. 
I don't know whether there are, are any moral saints, she remarks, but if there are, I am glad that neither I nor those about whom I care most are among them. She here expresses the common sentiment that conformity to moral ideas alone cannot yield a life that is humanly attractive. An agent whose every action is as morally good as possible would probably not be someone whom we would naturally wish to emulate or befriend. Wolf infers from this conclusion that ethical reasoning should not limit itself to the hierarchical notions of individual perfection, which underlie most moral theories. Rather, quote, both in our philosophizing and in our lives, we must be willing to raise normative questions from a perspective that is unattached to a commitment to any particular well-ordered system of values, close quote. So what defines the moral exemplar for, for Wolf is also what defines the moral theory more generally, namely adhering to a well-ordered system of values to which we must conform our every thought, word, and deed. A more stifling conception of moral excellence would be difficult to imagine, and so it's no wonder Wolf seeks out a broader set of criteria for explaining what makes human lives most admirable. The problem, however, is not so much with moral systems themselves, but rather with the totalizing tendency of those who advocate those systems. More specifically, the distortion of human life Wolf ascribes to moral sainthood is not the result of an over-prioritization of moral goodness, but an over-prioritization of moral theory in the determination of moral goodness. To put the point another way, Wolf's moral saint lives the desiccated and rarefied human life she does because her actions proceed from a total devotion to a system of thought rather than any object of love. To devote one's life wholly and entirely to the fulfillment of an ethical principle in this way is to get the proper relationship between moral theory and moral experience precisely backward. My study follows the lead of an American moral philosopher, Linda Zagzebski, in supposing that moral theory should serve as a map of moral experience. Just, because, just as a cartographer makes decisions about which features of a geographical area to include on a map, so the ethicist must make decisions about which components of human action to prioritize in their moral theory. As Zagzebski puts it, if every feature of the city were on the city map, the map would be as complex as the city and the map would not help us understand the city's layout. So the map leaves out many things, and it also may distort some things. Like you see the uh, subway map there of Manhattan and an actual satellite photograph of the same area. One must therefore remain attentive to the ways in which one's theoretical map selectively renders the moral landscape so that one never falls prey to the thought that one's theory tells you everything there is to know about the moral reality out there in the world. While some theories will take better account of certain aspects of the moral world than others, no theory can or should lay claim to exhaustive explanatory power, since to do so would invite precisely the sort of inversion of theory and experience exposed by Wolf's moral saint. The foundational premise of Zagzebski's moral theory, then, is her claim that, quote, there are elements of our pre-existing moral practices of which we are more certain than we are of any moral theory. Not only is moral theory posterior to experience, but it's also to a significant degree posterior to our most fundamental moral judgments. Zagzebski argues that these judgments are usually more reliable than any theoretical mechanism by which we might try to justify or critique them. While it is true that moral experience calls out for the engagement of critical reason, it is the experience itself which fixes the object to which reason seeks to apply itself. To be sure, there is no pure experience of moral goodness unaffected by the mediation of our psychological and cognitive structures, but that mediation itself presumes a real point of contact between those structures and something out there in the world. And it's upon such a point of contact, namely one between concrete exemplars and our admiration of them, that Zagzebski attempts to build her moral theory. Let me now offer a brief analogy at this point to help establish the plausibility of this methodological premise. In George MacDonald's classic ch children's story, The Golden Key, a boy is drawn to an enchanted forest where he sees a rainbow at the bottom of which he finds a golden key and is thus set upon a quest to find the lock that fits that key. Here's MacDonald's initial description of the rainbow. Suddenly, far among the trees, as far as the sun could shine, the boy saw a glorious thing. It was the end of a rainbow, large and brilliant. He could count all seven colors and could see shade after shade beyond the violet. While before the red stood a color more gorgeous and mysterious still, it was a color he had never seen before. The idea of a color one has never seen before functions here as a literary trope portraying the wonder of entering an enchanted realm. Yet the experience is one an increasing number of people are actually able to have. 
One need only run a YouTube search for Enchroma glasses, and a vast array of online videos will appear documenting the moment when people with varying degrees of color blindness see colors for the first time, colors they've never seen before. The glasses correct color blindness, according to their co-inventor, Donald McPherson, by reestablishing the correct balance between signals from the three photopigments in the eye. So the glasses correct a natural potency. They collect, correct the light ratios in the eye, allowing colors to register more clearly in the brain. Even the most skeptical of critics can see that this experience is one of profound novelty. Shades appear which have never registered before. Familiar objects, one always knew to be brown, now appear bright red. What is perhaps most striking about this experience, and I recommend viewing some of these videos if you haven't, is the intense wave of emotion this experience elicits, almost without exception. Why would that be the case? Why would a relatively simple adjustment of photopigment ratios lead to an experience of such intense emotion that it leaves virtually everyone who experiences it in tears? I will leave the granular details of that question to others, but my own general hypothesis is that the emotion comes from the wonder of seeing the same objects one has always seen, but in a profoundly new way. And the picture of the boy here, this is uh, Harold Whittles, one of the first people to receive um, a hearing aid in the 70s. You see it around his neck, and this is the expression he has when he first hears sound. We assign categories and associations to the things around us, and so become accustomed to their presence or absence. If these things suddenly appear with an utterly new and unforeseeable aspect, with a vibrancy one could not have previously imagined they could have, it is understandable how we might be profoundly moved by that experience. And so here's the analogy. I would submit that our deepest encounters with moral goodness are experiences of this kind. The particular manifestations of moral excellence that come to have the greatest impact on us do more than simply illustrate the proper way of applying a universal principle to a particular situation. They do more than simply demonstrate the maximal realization of a predetermined potential. The extraordinary quality of such moments is such that they enable us to see in common things some new and unimagined dimension. That's what moves us so deeply. It's instructive to show small children an object commonly regarded as prototypically red and say, this is red. They will learn the language game sooner or later. But it's something entirely different to properly balance the child's photopigments so as to enable her to perceive that color properly. Likewise, it is instructive to encounter in others actions that are an instance of the fulfillment of duty or the maximization of utility or the cultivation of the virtues necessary for human flourishing. But it is something entirely different to encounter actions that reveal unimagined dimensions of goodness that reorient one's entire understanding of what duty, utility, and flourishing could possibly mean. These latter sorts of encounters are what I believe lie at the core of our ethical orientation to the world. The wonder they elicit yields our most basic judgments about the relationship between our actions and our existence. In his book, A Common Humanity, the Australian philosopher Raymond Gaeta offers an example of this sort of experience from his own life. In the early 1960s, he worked as a ward assistant in a psychiatric hospital under a group of psychiatrists who he says acted out of a sincere belief that those with mental illness deserve to be treated with the same dignity as any other human being. He admired these psychiatrists because they seemed to him to be acting in accord with a moral conviction he himself held. Then one day, a nun came to visit the ward, and her actions completely transformed his perspective on the work that he and the psychiatrist had been doing. This is an extended quote. I, I apologize for those of you who have, have heard it. It's, it's a bit of a well-worn quote, but I need to uh, establish the point of reference here. Quote, the way she spoke to them, her facial expressions, the inflections of her body, contrasted with and showed up the behavior of those noble psychiatrists. She showed that they were, despite their best efforts, condescending, as I too had been. She thereby revealed that even such patients were, as the psychiatrists and I had sincerely and generously professed, the equals of those who wanted to help them. But she also revealed that in our hearts we did not believe this. Seeing her, however, I felt irresistibly that her behavior was directly shaped by the reality it revealed. I wondered at her, but not at anything about her, except that her behavior should have so wondrously this power of revelation. Her behavior was striking not for the virtues it expressed, or even for the good it achieved, but for its power to reveal the full humanity of those whose affliction had made their humanity invisible." Close quote. Now, the nun does not prompt Gaeta to revise or reverse any of his moral views, 
Rather, she brings him into contact with the reality that gives full sense to those views. For this reason, the experience became for Gaeta a permanent reference point for his own moral reflection. For Gaeta, such concrete manifestations of goodness lie at the foundation of moral reasoning. Since they establish a point of contact with the sort of goodness we have reason to believe is possible. And I'll just mention as a brief aside, this also works with moral evil, too. A bit more chilling, but... One can certainly attempt, as Gaeta himself did, to act upon the mere principle that every human life is worthy of basic care. But such principles cannot on their own give us a full sense of the beauty and worth of another person. They are, he says, certain there are, he says, certain moral conclusions whose truth only the love of saints can reveal. While Gaeta acknowledges the practical importance of universal principles, such as we always bear obligations to those we love, he argues that we would not find this principle intelligible unless, quote, we saw those others as being the intelligible beneficiaries of someone's love. Failing that, talk of rights and duties would begin to disengage from what gives it sense, close quote. In support of this claim, he remarks how one of the quickest ways to make prisoners morally invisible to their guards is to deny them visits from their loved ones, thereby ensuring that the guards never see them through the eyes of those who love them. The point that has all too relevant um, application today. That is a fact of considerable importance to reflection about the nature of morality. Our talk of rights is dependent on the works of love. In a similar way, Gaeta can never see the patients whom the nun loved as he saw them before her visit. To them, they now appear lovable in a way that he could never have imagined if he had not actually witnessed her loving them. Notice, however, that the nun did not merely reveal that it is possible to love mentally ill people or that by loving them they become lovable. Rather, her love revealed that these afflicted people have always been and always will be worthy of this kind of love. One cannot grasp another's true worth through any process of calculation, inference, or deduction. It, it discloses itself for Gaeta through an experience of wonder revealed through another's love. In this respect, Gaeta follows Simone Weil in supposing that the measure of a saint is not so much the degree to which their actions reveal the excellence they themselves possess, but rather the beauty and worth which their actions reveal in others, particularly those who are afflicted. As Vey once put the point, if I light an electric torch at night out of doors, I don't judge its power by looking at the bulb, but by seeing how many objects it lights up. Gita also takes another more well-known example of saintly love in the work of Mother Teresa. Quote, the nature of Mother Teresa's compassion is a matter for wonder, he concludes. But the wonder is not directed at her achievements. Much of what she did was an extraordinary achievement, and we wonder too at that, although in a different way, her tireless efforts, her resilience, and so on. Our wonder at these is conditioned by our sense of human possibilities and limitations. In the case of Mother Teresa, the point is not that her love issued into many good deeds, nor that her deeds shone like a jewel because of the purity of her motives. The salient point is that her love revealed, taught, what it is to be a human being because of the light it threw on the afflicted. The wonder which is in response to her is not a wonder at her, but a wonder that human life could be as her love revealed it to be. That is quite different from a Kantian kind of rejoicing at the purity of a deed. There's a sense in which she disappeared from consideration." Close quote. So those actions or agents that are truly exemplary in this way do more than just check a box already provided by a moral theory or present a maximum data point in light of which we can set a provisional limit of human potential. They cause those who encounter them profound amazement and gratitude that the world should be as they have revealed it to be. They therefore set the parameters for the delineation of the worldview in light of which regards, in light of which all action appears. They establish the horizon against which all else appears. Okay, so now moving on to Linda Zagzebski. Like Gaeta, Linda Zagzebski accords ultimate methodological priority to transformative encounters with moral excellence. Her exemplarist moral theory articulated most fully in her 2017 book of this same title departs from the premise that, quote, there are elements of our pre-existing moral practices of which we are more certain than we are of moral theory. The source of these pre-theoretical convictions, according to her, is the emotion of admiration. She explains, I think we are more certain that Confucius, Jesus, and Socrates, we might add Gandhi to the list, are admirable. We're more sure that they are admirable than we are of claims about the good of pleasure, of what human flourishing is, 
or the good of doing one's duty, or any other of the claims that are used to ground a moral theory. In fact, I think we are more certain that they are admirable than we are of what is admirable about them. This encounter with concrete instances of moral goodness provides the initial basis for our capacity to reason ethically. Zazebski argues that even before we're able to speak about an instance of moral goodness, the emotion of admiration gives us evidence that we have encountered it. We identify exemplars of goodness or virtue through admiration just as we identify natural kinds through sense perception. Just as those who are unaware of the chemical composition of water are nonetheless able to refer successfully to instances of water in the world, we're able to reliably identify instances of the kind good person by means of direct reference to individuals whose conduct elicits admiration in us. A good, just, wise, or courageous person is a person like that, where that refers to a concrete exemplar. Thus, exemplars are not simply individual embodiments of more general moral qualities, such as wisdom, justice, or courage. Rather, they fix the meaning of those qualities by their admirable actions. By observing or hearing about the actions of good people, we come to differentiate patterns of moral goodness that we collectively call the virtues. The meaning of these concepts emerges by way of common reference to exemplars. And so, they remain accountable to them. As Zagzebski puts it, exemplars are not simply stand-ins for abstract virtues whom we can ignore once we learn the virtues. We need exemplars all the time. So we don't wheel them in as illustrations after we're done setting out the abstract concept of the virtue. This primacy in ethical analysis merely reflects the primacy of exemplars in our moral lives. We come to reflect upon virtues only because we see them displayed in the lives of concrete individuals. As Aristotle himself points out, there are many virtues that we have yet to name. That's a crucial point. There are virtues out there that we don't know how to talk about yet. We observe them in others and know that they're there, but our way of thinking and speaking about them is still unfolding. Such is also the way we begin to cultivate the virtues. We first see them and admire them in others, even if we don't know what they are, and only then we can, can we emulate them in our own lives. So Zagzebski's exemplar's moral theory goes some way toward mapping out an approach to ethical inquiry that takes full account of the particular experiences and relationships that fundamentally orient our practical reason. For example, exemplar's moral theory helps to explain why Goethe described the nun's actions as revelatory. Both of these claims point to the determinative impact of personal encounters preceding reflective thought. Goethe refers to these encounters as experiences of wonder. Zagzebski uses the more common term admiration, but it functions much in the same way. And it's interesting that the Latin word for wonder is admiratio. In both these cases, the claim made on behalf of the significance of particular experience is universal in scope. And so Zagzebski argues that the emotion of admiration can serve as a true universal point of reference for any and all moral communities. She says that insofar as the emotion of admiration must correspond in all cases to certain features of what she calls deep psychological structures of the exemplars, one may venture to conclude that the exemplars of different moral traditions will possess many, if not all, such features in common. And here's where she gets into a lot of empirical analysis. She remarks that the admirable person is the repository of admirable qualities. This view nicely pinpoints the relevant objects of analysis for moral, for exemplarist theory and so renders it highly accessible to empirical study. But if one takes the view that what we find most admirable in our encounters with exemplars is not so much the qualities they possess, let alone the physiological structures, but the goodness their actions reveal in others, then things become a bit more complex. If love, as Gaeta would have it, is what fully reveals and actualizes one's highest capacities as a human being, then the ethical concepts of human excellence, fulfillment, or flourishing refer most properly to a kind of relation between agents, and only secondarily to those individual characteristics which make that relation possible. This manner of recasting Zazebski's theory suggests that the identification of the, morally good, of the moral good upon which the theory is built, a good person is like that, derives from an even more basic identification of the human good as a participation in a particular kind of relation. So this one way of extending Zazebski's theory, which I would like to do, would be to shift its focus more toward exemplary action, interactions, friendships, or communities, since these relational foci are able to embody forms of moral goodness that individuals alone can't. It's at this point that paradigms of exemplarity come into play. All right, so fast forward a bit here. 
So Zabzebski realizes that there are different patterns of exemplarity, different patterns of, of, of reasons why we admire certain exemplars. And she identifies three in her book, The Hero. She gives an example of Leopold Socha, the Holocaust rescuer, the sage, Confucius, and the saint, Jean Vanier, and also the L'Arche caregivers. She believes that each of these paradigms of exemplarity can be identified by reference to a typical or prototypical virtue. Uh, courage in the case of a hero, wisdom in the case of a sage, compassion or charity in the case of a saint. She also, though, suggests, but only briefly, that these differences between paradigms can come into play in moral communities. So just as one particular virtue dominates a particular paradigm of exemplarity, a particular paradigm of exemplarity can come to dominate a community's moral life. So the idea that human excellence cultivates in self-transcendence, for instance, mediated through love, this is a kind of Christian ideal, it's not clear that it would be ultimately intelligible within a Homeric context. And likewise, the idea that human excellence culminates in an extraordinary act of individual prowess may not be intelligible within a Christian context. Even if they are intelligible, you're going to have an inevitable hierarchy, prioritization of one paradigm over another. Okay. So just very briefly then, to tie this into Christian ethics, Incommensurable differences regarding the ultimate nature or purpose of the world, as well as the nature and purpose of the human person, inevitably lead to intractable disagreements about what it means to act well. So to say God is love isn't just a claim about uh, deity, it's also an ontological claim. It suggests that the ground of all reality is best characterized as act and relation, rather than stasis and individual essence. And so it leads Christians to believe that relations of love both reveal and fulfill our true identity as individuals. And for this reason, I take Gaeta's and Zagzebski's account of how our moral ref reflection emerges as deeply, is deeply resonant with a Christian understanding of the world and the human good. So for the Christian, after all, to be a saint is to be an intimate, unceasing relation to God and to others. And Christians take love to be both the means and the end of this relation, such that the admiration of a saint's conduct is nothing but the admiration of the manifestation of God's love within the particular circumstances of a person's life. As the Gospels make clear, one discovers what is good only through a particular encounter with the one who is good, source of all goodness. The Gospels are filled with these moments of revelation. From the moment the disciples encounter Jesus to the moments of the crucifixion, the recognition of the centurion on Golgotha and Mark, to Mary encountering Jesus in the garden, to Thomas inside a house, to the disciples in Emmaus. These encounters are the very core of the gospel story, and they, Christians believe, are revelatory. As Pope Benedict XVI once put it, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event a person which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. I think St. John, most of all of the New Testament writers, explains this in ethical terms. This is how we know what love is, he states plainly in his first letter. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's in 1 John chapter 3, and it's only in 1 John chapter 4 that he goes on to say then, God is love. We don't really know what that predicate means, what that attribution could entail, without this direct reference to the event of the incarnation and Christ's death. All right, um, well, I think, I think I'm about out of time. I, I do have um, something here that I, I could bring out if there are questions about how this applies to the topic of supererogatory acts of the universe, unity of the virtues. 
also have a little thing about my two uh, case studies at the end. But uh, I think maybe I'll just I'll just conclude with uh, this this brief concluding paragraph here. Let's see if I can find it. Well, I'll just I'll just take some questions now. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I love this. This was really interesting to me. Um, and I loved your story about the nun and the psychologist. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is that I was thinking while listening to this, like, when we hear the story about the nun, we're kind of in the same position as the psychologists who believe it but don't see it. Um, it seems like for this to, and, and, and when we hear about Gandhi and we read about these figures, we're not having the experience. So um, that's just something that's interesting to me. Like it seems like we can we can talk about it, but we're engaging the theory, we're not having the experience. And so we need those people to be present. So that's just an yes. observation. But um, the other thing that I was thinking about this, just because of a conversation I was having just right before this, what about the problems? I mean, what about, you know, so Gandhi, right, um, did, scandalous things, apparently. Um, and sometimes the people we have that, what happens if we have that moment and we're like, oh, that's what love is. And then we find out that this is an appalling person. Um, what happens if that aha, which I love, right? If that, you know, we're hearing, we're seeing color for the first time because we saw this, um, what if it's wrong? And, and that, that it seems to me that it's sometimes very difficult to tell the difference between charisma and mm -hmm. moral quality. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you do with that. Hmm. Okay, those are both really excellent, excellent uh, comments, questions. Uh, let, let me just address the first because, and then, and then, the, and then I'll get to the second one. Um, so, the one thing I like about Gates' writing, and he comes more from the school of Iris Murdoch and a more Platonic approach, is that he doesn't allow the reader to presume that since he's laid out for you an idea that with which you may agree or some data that may correspond with the you know uh, thesis about exemplars this is kind of what Zabzewski does a lot that you then have grasped what the moment contains he never lets you get away with that um, and it's just by means of his writing that's one of the things about Zabzewski's approach that I worry about is that uh, you can too easily buy into her very neat, well laid out and compelling theory and feel like, okay, I get it. But maybe you don't. I mean, that's where, where the platonic approach kind of is, is I think, better because it leaves you in the position, maybe you've experienced some of it, but you certainly haven't experienced all there is to experience. You certainly haven't had the, all of the aha moments that are out there to have. And so you're still in a position of receptivity and waiting and, and looking and attentiveness. Uh, and this is where he draws on uh, Simone Weil for a lot. But it raises an important question. Um, can you have this aha moment through reading about fictional figures? Say, like in, in your Dostoevsky or Jane Austen or something. So Zabzewski definitely thinks that you can. But it's interesting that there, there's a, a, a part um, in Alistair McIntyre's writings where he says, no, you can't. They have to be real. And, and he's very much more rigorously Aristotelian. We would say, no, you, t t to know what a true human capacity is, you have to encounter it directly in a specimen of, of the human species. It can't just be uh, a figure in Isaac Asimov book, because there you, you may not be dealing with really truly human potentials. And I think I, I may agree more with McIntyre about that, although I do think that, that literature can really serve a, a kind of propedeutic function in this regard. Now, if, if you'll just indulge me a little about the second question, because it is a shame that I didn't really uh, able to get to it, but um, I'll just point this, the, the question about the flawed exemplar, and, and really what, what this is, what, what your second question addressed was scandal. So you have an aha moment that refers uh, to an exemplar, and then later you find out that exemplar is just a creep, or just a really bad guy, or maybe just somebody who really honestly struggles with a vice, you know. Um, so what do you do then uh, in that situation? This, this really touches upon the, the problem of the flawed saint, uh, and, and that really ties into the whole debate about the unity of the virtues. 
The question of can someone display virtue to an extraordinary extent and yet also display serious vice? And both in the super arrogation debate and this debate, I think that the difference between heroes and, and saints really does help. Um, Andrew Flesher's work is very important to me in this regard, um, his book, Heroes, Saints, and Ordinary Morality. And, and he sort of says, you know, um, as opposed to J.R. Ermson, who says, saints and heroes are, are over and above. They do things that we could never do. We're not expected to do them, so we can just admire them at a distance. They really have no moral authority or moral sort of influence on our lives. He, Andrew Flesher, wants to say, no, heroes should have some pull upon us because they're just ordinary people who get put in extraordinary situations and do extraordinary things. Saints go out and look for those things, and so they're a little bit too far off. We really can't directly emulate them. So I agree with his first example. Heroic exemplars do, they, they demonstrate the integral connection between virtues. And so people with serious vices, they can't perform heroic actions. You know, like a child molester can rescue a child from a burning building. And you could say that's heroic. But it does mitigate against you saying, well, that person is generally an exemplar because they have this other vice. So it doesn't take away anything from the, the act of heroism, but it does take away from sort of the, 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 the credibility or moral authority of that particular person. Saintly exemplars, though, sort of interesting, they disclose this vision. <clears throat> so they themselves could even fade away. So the creep could... <laughs> You know, the bad guy could uh, reveal a new dimension of goodness to you, and you could never even see him again. Uh, and as far as you're concerned, he's transformed your whole vision of the world, um, and you, you move on from there. And it doesn't even matter what his history is subsequently uh, or prior to that experience. Uh, but the same dynamic can operate in a certain way if that saintly exemplar who revealed this moment of, of new vision turns out to be vicious in other ways. It, it, it can damage the, the credibility of that vision. It can call it into doubt. But it works along much the same lines as Christians think grace works, where some moments of, of grace and revelation can be the result of an entire lifetime. The example I used here was like uh, someone kissing their spouse upon their deathbed for the last time after six years of, you know, fidelity. It's beautiful. It takes a lifetime to get that revelatory moment and a lot of character and virtue, right? But you could also have the penitent on their deathbed, right, who receives a moment of grace after, you know, a really vicious, horrible life and nevertheless is able to impart a glance, a word, touch. That can also transform the person who, who witnesses it. So I feel like the saintly exemplarity operates much along the lines of the order of grace. Um, I think beyond, moving beyond this project, I would try to connect this whole thing with um, infused virtue, perhaps, or just the way that grace works in relation to nature in Aquinas. Um, so I'm ready to get back to Aquinas after this book. But Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about the epistemology of the revelation. It seems like there are two aspects. One is, that, you know, when you see the nun come into the, the psychiatric hospital, that you have a new kind of experience of the patients, uh, given the way that she treats them. And then the second part, which is that somehow that experience is veridical. I think you kind of, you, you kind of mentioned this when you said that you could have a similar experience with evil, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, seems like we could see someone come in and treat the patients terribly, and, we, and that might be a new experience too. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering if it's part of your, your claim that s there's something more epistemically secure about the morally good experience. Mm -hmm. We know this is the right way to think about these people, the one that's revealed by the nun rather than the one that's revealed by the, you know, the anti-saint or something. Um, and if, if that's part of the thesis, why we should think that these experiences are like that, whether they're sort of self-vindicating or like have default entitlement in, in some way or other? Does that make sense? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so, yes, uh, both Nagzebski and Gaeta lay out a vision of the moral world that's very fragile and contingent. And so sometimes they're accused of being moral relativists in this sense because you, you really don't have any ideal third-person omniscient perspective from which to evaluate all instances of morality, good and bad. You have to start with the things that you encounter in the world. It's very inductive. 
but they're also uh, moral realists of the most extraordinary kind. And, and I think at least uh, Gaeta follows Murdoch in this. Mor moral goodness and moral evil are both out there. You can bump into them. And when you bump into them, they change you. And uh, the question of, well, which one is primary, which one is true, this gets into territory, at least for Gaeta, that is, is too metaphysical to say anything meaningful about. Um, you know, as, as a theologian, I sort of want him to say more. He doesn't feel like he can say more at that point. But, you know, behind this question of, well, which reality out there is, is, is dominant, I ultimately think that it's, it's, it's one of these worldview questions, one of these questions about the nature of everything that you have to presume one way or another. You have to make some sort of provisional hypothesis to make sense of things within those holes. But nothing within the holes tells you anything with, that, that's conclusive about that. So you could have like, um, you know, the social Darwinian of the most uh, vile stripes say, well, violence is all there is. They have experienced, you know, extraordinary violence all their lives, so that's what they know. Little moments of goodness are just preludes to further acts of violence. What can you say to that? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of uh, really moved, and this is maybe kind of a fast and loose thing to say, but I'm, I'm moved by attachment therapy that in, in response to uh, uh, people who have experienced lots of trauma, they, they counsel them to just hug them physical contact, like don't, don't say anything, just like hold them for like two hours every day. Um, yeah, I think you would have to begin there to, to reorient their sense of what the world is. But yeah, ultimately like, well, how do we get the final answer at the back of the book? I don't think either of them pretend that, you know, you can really see that from, from our particular perspective. I think they're too kind of inductive for that. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was also struck by the suggestion that we can come to see the moral worth of people in a different way by witnessing their interactions with others and treat them as worthy or as wonderful. Um, but I think you also suggested that that was the only way of coming to see moral worth in a new way. Uh, I wonder if that might be a bit too strong. Uh, I'm thinking here of examples of people who at least report that they came to see the moral worth of, say, non-human animals <coughs> through the arguments, specifically through arguments by philosophers and animal rights activists and so on, uh, rather than through witnessing direct interactions with human animals. So I was wondering whether you were being committed to the idea that the only way of coming to recognize moral worth in the way is in the way you it here, which does seem very important, or whether you're open to the possibility of different groups, uh, like those two examples. Right, um, good. I, I think that well, there's several ways you could respond. Um, Zagzebski would say, first of all, that this particular way of making sense of the moral experience isn't exhaustive, and so other ones can, can complement it or can account for the same reality in a different way. Um, I think she might also say, though, that your encounter with whoever took the time and trouble to think that issue through is an encounter with someone. So she has a very maximal account of what exemplarity is as opposed to McIntyre says you have to actually be there and see them and they have to be real and so on. Uh, you, you can encounter this through not only literary figures but also through theorists. So somebody had to write that. Somebody had to do that study. Now I, I'm intrigued by the idea of well maybe you could just collect enough data um, about a particular non-human animal <clears throat> and say, you know, like, you, you don't reveal what animal that is. You don't, you don't say if it's a chicken or a dolphin or a dog or what have you. And you just see all the data and be like, this is an extraordinary animal. What, what animal is this? And then you could come to have a sort of moral attitude toward that animal based on, you know, the, the data, the descriptions, the observations, and so forth, and not a direct experience. I think that can certainly condition uh, your attitude toward them and maybe even lead you to something like that kind of experience. Uh, I just don't think you can capture as much as looking at them and observing them and um, I, I just think it's sort of the difference between 
um, you know, describing a picture and actually seeing it. Uh, but but I do think there is something to that. So I certainly want to wouldn't want to rule out those those means of uh, input, getting input about the moral world. Go a little bit over real quick. Alina, do you real quick? Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a follow up on Angela's question. Um, I really like the, the picture that you laid out, like what can the saint show us. I worry about something like an equivalent of, uh, like the moral equivalent of gay problem, basically, where you see this extraordinary action, right, and you have this like revelatory moment that allows you to see these colors. Lo and behold, that action turned out to be pretty despicable. That's what I was asking. <laughs> so not the, it's not that the agent who did the action uh, is otherwise vicious, but that action itself turns out to be an action of vice. So someone caring for orphans, when in fact they're actually grooming the children to abuse. Right, right. Well, I, th I, you know, I, I, um, yeah, that would hit more directly at that that experience. So. Um, these, I would say, these moments are, are are primary and transformative in a way that that other uh, uh, moments aren't. Other means of access to the moral world aren't. But but they're not they're not um, immutable, um, and and they're also subject to critical reflection and and revision upon just uh, one's own thought and analysis. Um, and certainly they would they would be vulnerable to. Uh, you know, further information about w what those acts actually are. But you know, an interesting case of this um, is is Joseph Mengele, who apparently was was very good with children, like very tender with children. There are people who witnessed Joseph Mengele like interacting with the children, whom the, he would then go on to directly kill, uh, being being extraordinarily kind to them, and being so almost moved by his kindness towards them. Now, I feel like. That isn't just simply, well, uh, that, that cuts away at the vision of moral goodness. I feel like that heightens the evil that you're experiencing. That's, I mean, that's not just like you're falling short of the mark there. Something more than that. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of the, you know, the Holocaust uh, ethicists. That you can't you just describe acts like that as vicious or morally wrong or falling short. Uh, and there's something more. Now, whether you call it evil or um, however you describe it, it's, um, yeah, so, you know, like I guess the quote St. Ignatius, the, um, uh, the angel of darkness can appear as an angel of light for sure. Yeah, so. Thanks.